What's up guys? Welcome to another audiobook. Today we're going to be starting off Friendly Face and as you can see this is just a preview at the moment but if you're watching this uh, as the full audiobook then it won't be a preview later on obviously. Um, so yeah this is part one of Friendly Face. If you're watching the part one this is just a preview. <laughs> so yeah people get confused. It, the book isn't actually out yet but it will be when the full audiobook comes out. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. Anyway, friendly face. I'm so excited. We finally have a preview uh, slash the, the full book. <laughs> uh, and yeah, here we go. Edward's cereal bowl hit the floor and shattered. Milk and soggy flakes blashed his jeans. Edward jumped up, frowned and looked around, reminding himself of where he was. Right. He was in the kitchen, old-fashioned red laminate counters, bright white farm-style sink, retro fridge and stove, smells of ripening bananas, and that alfalfa his mum put in her energy smoothie. He'd been eating breakfast until he got lost in his book. He looked down and stared at the remains of his bowl. Edward, you have to be more careful, his mum snapped. Edward glanced at her. His mum looked harried. Harried? <laughs> As usual. A few auburn strands had come loose from the twist she always wore her hair in. She was shaking her head and rubbing her temples as she stared at the mess on the scuffed hardwood floor. How'd that get down there? Edward asked. His mum sighed. She leaned over and started picking up pieces of green stoneware. Edward bent over to help her and had their heads bumped together. Ow! they shouted in unison. His mother straightened and scowled at him. In one hand, she held the stoneware shards. She used the other hand to probe the red spot on her forehead. Edward opened his mouth to apologise, but a look from his mother silenced him. She walked to the trash can under the sink and dropped in the broken cereal bowl. Edward grabbed a napkin from the round kitchen table, squatted and started wiping up the milk and cereal. Edward. His mum yelled out, sorry, his mum held out, a wet rag for him to use on the floor. He took it and started swiping it this way and that. His swift motions flung bits of cereal farther across the floor. His mum sighed again. Just leave it. I'll get it. Go brush your teeth. You're going to miss the bus. Edward stood and seized the moment to apologise. Sorry, I don't know how that bowl fell. His mum opened her mouth, closed it, took a deep breath and then reached out and ruffled his hair. He squirmed. He wished he wouldn't do that. It was like she couldn't tell the difference between 8th grade and 8. She still tried to treat him like a little kid, even though he'd been 13 for months. He was a teenager now. He needed her to get that. He looked at her tight face. Now probably wasn't the best time to try to explain it though. Edward and his mum had been on their own for a long time, and for the most part, they were close. They looked alike too, which could be embarrassing. Even with the subtle makeup his mum wore, her hazel eyes... Small nose, wide mouth and strong jaw were almost mirror images of his own features. It was uncanny. His hair was the exact colours of her too, but his hair wasn't getting long enough to twist. Well, my little science geek, his mum said. What was that question you were asking the other day about unstoppable forces? What happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? That question. Edward scrunched up his face. What did the irresistible force paradox have to do with anything? His mum nodded. That one. Well, I can't answer it. But I do know what happens when a cereal bowl pushed to the edge of the table meets the elbow of an inattentive boy who is reading at breakfast instead of eating. Not a boy, Edward said. Fine, team. Same result. You need to focus on one thing at a time, Edward. You get in a hurry, and that's why you're so prone to accidents. If you want to live through your teen years, you need to pay attention. Well... Well, I, I was paying attention to what I was reading, Edward said. That's not... His mum sighed again. Go pay attention to brushing your teeth. Edward shrugged and turned to leave the kitchen. Your book, his mother said. Oh. He turned and took it from her. She shook her head and smiled at him in the lopsided way she had whenever she, he messed up. It was like she was saying, you're a hopeless case, but I love you anyway. Edward hesitated, then hugged his mum. Sorry. Edward, are you listening? 
Edward looked up at Mrs. Sterling, who frowned at him from the front of his 8th grade science class. Sorry. I asked if you could please grab the iron filings from the cabinet. You're the closest to it. Oh, sure. Edward turned around and opened the metal cabinet behind him. They'd been talking about the whole unstoppable force, immovable object thing again at the start of class today, and his brain couldn't stop chewing on it. Thanks to his many questions about it, Mrs. Sterling had assigned a paper uh, on the subject. He thought about how he was going to organise his essay while he grabbed the filings. Okay, so now we're going to witness the power of magnets, Mrs. Sterling announced. She beamed at the class. Mrs. Sterling was middle-aged with a round face and a wide smile. She always looked like she was having the time of her life, even when she wasn't. She presided like a game show host over the classroom, which was full of desks, lab tables, and cabinets of vials and beakers. Charts, diagrams, and photos of scientific anomalies littered the walls, an endless number of distractions for Edward's curious mind. Edward, since you're up here, Mrs. Sterling said, why don't you sprinkle those things on that magnet? She pointed to a flat grey box-like contraption on her desk before turning away to write something on the blackboard. He tried to see what she was writing while he opened the vial he grabbed and without looking sprinkled a mound of filings on the flat surface. Thank you, Edward, Mrs. Sterling said. You can return to your seat. Edward nodded and headed back to his desk. OK, here we go. She flipped the switch on a fan that was set up in front of the magnet. Suddenly, the front of the class was pelted with tiny black particles, and everybody started to sneeze. Mrs. Sterling, being nearest to her desk, sneezed the hardest. She also closed her eyes tightly. One of the girls in the front row squealed. Another cried out, My eyes! <laughs> Turn off the fan, a boy shouted. Mrs. Sterling, her eyes still shut, groped around for the fan and ended up knocking it over. Edward sneezed, and his eyes started to burn. What had happened? Are you sure those were iron filings you grabbed? His best friend... Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. His best friend, Jack. <laughs> like Jack from the puppet cover? I don't know. Uh, his best friend, Jack, asked, pulling his shirt up over his nose. Edward wiped at his runny nose. Sure, I... He cringed and turned to look at the cabinet. The vial of iron filings was still sitting there. He grabbed the pepper Mrs. Sterling had used in their surface tension experiment a couple days before. Everyone out, Mrs. Sterling commanded in a shrill tone. She was staggering around, tears streaming from her eyes, but she was still smiling. Clut's face strikes again, one of the boys shouted as they all ran from the classroom. Sorry, Edwards said when he joined the classmates in the hallway. I... He stopped and shrugged. There was no point in trying to explain, so he just repeated, Sorry. I wonder how many times a day I say sorry, Edward said to Jack as their bus trundled away from school that afternoon. Sorry? Jack tugged on their earbuds and turned his smiling face toward Edward. I didn't hear you. Could you repeat what you said? Nothing. Jack shrugged and put his earbuds back in. His smile stayed in place. Jack was nearly always smiling. One reason for that was his lips were naturally upturned. Another was that Jack was just generally happy all the time. Ah, so it's, it's not the same Jack. <laughs> Edward had never known anyone as good-natured as Jack. His, uh, his warm brown eyes already had faint smile crinkles at the corners. Edward gazed at the golden spiral on Jack's baggy t-shirt for a second and wondered what Jack was listening to. It was always an audiobook, never music. It's always oh, Ozone's audiobooks. Then he turned and stared out the window. The junior high school Edward and Jack attended was part of a complex that also included the town's high school. The complex had been built just a year before to replace the old middle school, which had succumbed to a mould problem deemed too expensive to remedy. The new school complex was nice, but due to the zoning issue, it had been built a few miles outside town. Because of this, the first part of the bus ride home was, went through a relatively wild area. Or at least, Edward thought of it as wild. The route cut through a thick forest. Tall fir trees pressed up against one another at the edge of the gravel on the roadside. Most of Edward's classmates loved the woods. Uh, on Monday morning in homeroom, 
they talk about catching craw crawdads. What's a crawdad? Crawdads in the creek, floating all day in a deep swimming hole a half mile or so from the school, and playing king of the hill on what the local legend said were old burial mounds. Edward, however, didn't like the forest. It was too dark, too easy to get lost in. It left a chill on the back of his neck, the idea of the trees closing in, dampening the sound so no one could hear you scream. Edward shifted on the hard bus seat. The padding under the vinyl was warm, and for an uncomfortable moment he felt swallowed by his thoughts. When he repositioned, he flung out an elbow. Ow, Jack said. Sorry, Edward winced. There it was again. He should start counting. Was there endless repetition of a sorry, a mental condition? Like Tourette's or something? Maybe he had a neurological issue, and that was why his elbows, and his body in general, were always getting him in trouble. He shifted again, and this time he kicked Jack in the ankle. Jack jerked his leg away and studied Edward. Sorry, Edward said. Jack again removed his earbuds. This time, he put them away. Do you have something weighing on you? You've been weird all day. As opposed to other days, do you think there's any day that I'm not weird? Jack quirked his full lips and rubbed his nose. You make a valid point. He leaned over and bumped shoulders with Edward. But it takes weird to know weird. One of the girls seated in front of Edward and Jack whirled around and gave them a look. You're both weird. <laughs> Edward flushed. The girl, Julia, was one of the most popular kids in this year, which meant she was the antithesis of him. Most days, that didn't bother him. He and Jack had decided a long time ago that they existed in their own universe. They might have to hang out in this one. But theirs was separate. They were sort of like the Loch Ness Monster, which Edward was convinced lived in another dimension and occasionally came through a wormhole to visit this one. Why else would the monster be spotted only ten times or so a year? He looked into Julia's pretty eyes. He wondered if his theory would interest her. He opened his mouth, but before he could speak, she rolled her bright blue irises. Thanks to you two, we all have to write papers on why it's impossible for an unstoppable force to exist in the same universe as an immovable object. Jack's smile widened, and he bounced in his seat. What's the issue with that? It's quite entertaining to think about. Just imagine if this bus had infinite energy and- Shut up! Julia turned around. Edward stared at the, at the way her wavy black hair hung from the back of her head like a waterfall cascading over rocks on a moonlit night. He glanced at Jack remembering Jack's laughter when Edward had shared his feelings with him a couple weeks before. Have you lost interest in the sci-fi genre and developed one of a romantic fiction? Jack had spotted between guffaws. She lives on a different plane of existence, Edward. It's not possible. For reasons Edward didn't understand, this universe, not the one he and Jack were from, had its basis in a couple of strange equations. Equation 1. Interest in science minus interest in sports equals weird. Equation 2. Weird plus small equals outcast. <laughs> too true. Too true. Who decided this stuff? He wasn't sure. It seemed like nerds generally made more money. Nerds created stuff that, the world, that made the world better. So who invented this popularity calculus? And who distributed the memo about it? It just seemed to be something everyone knew. You coming? Jack asked. Edward blinked and looked around. Several kids were getting off the bus. Edward looked out the window. This was their stop. Jack and Edward stood, but something wet and gooey smacked Ed Edward in the cheek. Fazgoo! <laughs> uh, before he could reach up, the gooey object, chewed gum, oh, uh, bounced onto his chest and stuck to the left eye of his smiley face t-shirt. He tried to flick it off, but it clung. He grabbed it, almost gagging at the grossness of the slick spittle covering the gum. In spite of that human slime, the gum stuck to his fingers. <laughs> Is it actually Fazgoo? <laughs> Come on, Jack urged. He was already standing in the aisle. Edward sighed and pulled on the gum. He got most of it off his shirt and had to hold it as they got off the bus. He was tempted to try to wipe it on a seat as he went down the aisle, but that would be wrong. He'd wait until he got out, then he'd wipe it onto a rock or something. He looked around, no way of knowing who threw the gum. Anyone in the universe might have. As soon as Edward was off the bus, the driver, Don, a big semi-retired man with curly grey hair, called out, Have a good one. Edward waved his Don at Don as the bus doors closed with a thump. 
The bus belched exhaust and rumbled away. Jack carefully centred his stack of books in front of his belly and asked, What would you like to do this afternoon? Edward watched the other kids meander down the street. He stepped away from the curb and reached down to pick up a rock from the flower bed at the edge of Mrs Phillips' yard. After a glance at her window to be sure she wasn't watching, he used the rock to scrape the gum from his fingers. Then he bent back down to reposition the rock, gum side down, exactly where he'd found it. As he set the rock in place, he heard a faint sound. Edward froze and listened. What was that? The bus was nearly at the end of the block. When it turned the corner, the noise of the engine grew fainter, and the sound coming from Mrs Phillips' flower bed got louder. It seemed to be a cross between a squeak and a chirp. Was it an injured bird? A chipmunk? Edward dropped to his knees and began looking around under the big... Okay. Rhododendron. Rhododendron. Shrub. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. Uh, guarding Mrs Phillips' seasonal plantings. Because it was January, the flower bed had no flowers at the moment. Instead, it held a collection of winter-clad gnomes, all of which wore hand-knit sweaters Mrs Phillips had made herself. Whatever was making the sound made it again. It was louder now. Chwee, chwee! What are you doing? Jack asked. Uh, shush. Don't you hear that? <laughs> hear what? Edward ducked his head under the bush and gently repositioned a gnome wearing a ski cap. The sound shifted to a pronounced hiss, and he yanked his hand back. I think there's a snake in here, he said. Well then, why are you placing your hand in that vicinity? The hissing stopped, and the sound returned. Only this time, it was more of a mwi than a tree. <laughs> hey, I heard that, Jack said. A snake couldn't make that sound. Jack leaned over, brushed off a spot on the sidewalk and positioned his stack of books at the edge of the flower bed. He knelt, down, he knelt next to Edward and leaned in to peer past the gnomes. Together, Edward and Jack moved another gnome. From beyond their hands, something hissed again, and they emitted another mui. Jack held aside a rhododendron branch, and two yellow eyes peered out of them. It's a kitten, Jack exclaimed. His usual smile turned into a huge grin. The kitten said again, Mui? Hello, kitty, Jack said in a smoothing tone. In its smoothing, soothing tone. It's a pleasure to meet you, little guy. You have no reason to be afraid. We have no intention of hurting you. Edward leaned over and craned to see past Jack's outstretched hand. It was dark under the bush, and the only part of the kitten that was clear was his eyes. Come on, little buddy, Jack coaxed, his voice an octave higher than Edward had ever heard it. We can assist you. Jack turned to whisper to Edward. I don't suppose you have any cat food in your backpack. Edward snorted. The kitten hissed. Jack whispered again. I don't think Faraday likes you. Faraday? Edward whispered back. You know, Michael Faraday, the famous scientist. He founded two laws of electrochemistry. That's true. Uh, I, I know a lot about Faraday. Uh, Jack was still whispering. <laughs> the kitten had stopped hissing. Of course. Hmm. Him. <laughs> Edward grinned. Every day, Jack told Edward something he didn't know. Edward was pretty sure he leaned more from Jack than he did at school. A truck engine revved, and Edward turned to frown at it. On the other side of their neighbourhood, some developer was putting in a new subdivision. Heavy machinery had been cutting through Edward and Jack's neighbourhood for the last week or so. Huh. Interesting. Well, that's, that's the end of the preview. Uh, so... Yeah, that's, that's the end of the preview. Uh, if you're listening to the full audiobook, then we will cut to the next part now. According to Edward's mother, dump trucks would be going back and forth for months. The truck's roar faded away. Someone yelled out. The kitten opened its mouth and let out another... Mwee! <laughs> I thought kittens meowed, Edward said. Kittens have a wide variety of vocalisations, Jack replied. Their communication is as idiosyncratic as that of the average human. Although the homogeneity of our classmates' utterances argues against human singularity. What are those words? <laughs> Edward frowned and opened his mouth to ask Jack to explain what he was talking about, but Jack went on. I recommend that you retreat for a moment. I believe I am establishing a bond with Faraday. We'll include you as soon as we've solidified our connection. 
Um, sure. Edward dropped from his knees to his butt and scooted backward. Even though it was cold outside, the cement felt warm through his jeans. He glanced up at the bright sun, then closed his eyes and watched spots dance behind his eyelids. He listened to his friend. Establishing a bond, he grinned. Edward and Jack had been friends since they were babies. Could babies even be friends? According to his mother, Jack and Edward played together before they could walk. He wondered what they did. Did they drool on each other? At any rate, to say that Edward and Jack grew up together might be overstating a bit. Neither one of them had managed to reach anything approaching a normal height for their age. Consequently, they'd been relentlessly teased from the moment they entered school. But honestly, even if Jack wasn't short, he would still invite derision. It was the way he talked, and the way he thought. Take the question about cat food, for example. He wasn't kidding when he asked that. Jack got into physics when he was basically old enough to read. His understanding of quarks and atoms dwarfed that of any of their teachers. He loved talking about duality, the fact that quantum entities existed as waves and particles at the same time. It's all infinite possibility, Jack loved to say. He thought anything was possible, like that his best friend might be carrying around cat food, even though he didn't have a cat. Edward, Jack said. Edward opened his eyes. Jack knelt in front of him, holding a scrawny black kitten. Meet Faraday, Jack said in a quiet voice. Faraday, this is Edward. He's okay. He's just a bit of a klutz. Klutz? Klutz. That's, that's what I meant. I meant klutz. Uh, I suggest you stay away from his elbows. The kitten was purring. He and Jack apparently had completed their bond. Jack's head was bent. The kitten tucked under his broad chin. For a second, it was hard to see where the kitten's fur stopped and Jack's hair began. Jack's hair was as black as the kitten's fur. Interesting. Edward shifted his gaze from Jack to the kitten. Hey, Faraday, he said. He held a finger in front of the kitten's tiny nose. The kitten sniffed Edward's finger and kept purring. He might like you after all, Jack said. Um, is there a reason you've named a kitten that isn't yours? Edward asked. Jack shrugged. He needs a name. Should we take him to the shelter? Jack shook his head. No, I don't believe that would be best for him. Faraday stopped burring. Jack murmured, hi murmured to him and scratched him behind the ears. I think that we should keep him, Jack said. My mum won't... I know. Mine will, as long as we take care of him. We? Well, you found him. You have to be one of the dads. I haven't exactly had a lot of role models for fatherhood. And I do, Jack said. True. Edward's dad left when Edward was three. He lived on the other side of the country with his second wife and three new kids. At Christmas and on Edward's birthday, he'd send a stupid card with $20 inside. Jack's dad was still in the picture, but he was a long haul trucker. And when he was home, all he wanted to do was watch sports, drink sodas and eat junk food. He didn't understand Jack and had joked on more than one occasion that he wasn't convinced uh, Jack was actually his son. Another car went by. Hey freaks, some jerk shouted. Forget the way home. Edward looked up and recognised a couple of the guys who lived up the street, both part of the group that played baseball in the streets in the summer. Let's go, he said to Jack. Jack held out Faraday. You take him so I can get my books. Edward gingerly accepted the furry bundle, uh, tensing in expectation of a hiss or something worse. He wasn't used to animals. He liked them, but his mum never let him have one. He had no idea how to even hold a kitten, let alone how to take care of it. Edward didn't think Jack knew either. A either? Either. <laughs> it was a cross between either and either. Uh, he sounded pretty confident about his mum letting him keep Faraday, but the only pet he'd ever had was a goldfish he'd named Costo. Is that French? Uh, I've no idea. Just a year ago, they'd had an hour-long memorial service after Jack found Costo floating upside down in his bowl. Ed would have thought this hour-long service was excessive, but Jack pointed out that Costo had been alive longer than Jack and Edward. Jack's mum had bought Costo for Jack's nursery before he was born, so he deserved the appropriate respect. Edward looked into Faraday's eyes. 
The kitten blinked at him. He gently stroked the cat's fur. It was dirty and felt stiff. Just like my... Will to live, I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, Jack said. Let's go. Where are we going? Home? Let's go to the corner store and acquire food for him. Then we'll go to my house. Edward nodded and they headed down the block. Don't you think we should put up signs or something? What if someone is looking for it? Edward asked. It is named Faraday and I don't think anyone's been taking care of him. How do you know? How do I know what? That no one is caring for him. Or that he is male. <laughs> what? Both. Well, the answer is the same. I had my hands on him. Feel how dirty and brittle his fur feels. He's been outside and he's not getting good nutrition. Jack glanced at Faraday, who had relaxed into the crook of Edward's arm. Edward could feel Faraday's quick heartbeat and the warmth of his tiny body against his own chest. There was something oddly calming about it. Well, I think we should put up signs, Edward said. Feel free to pursue your own agenda. My agenda is caring for our new cat. True to Jack's prediction, his mum had no trouble with Faraday. That wasn't all that surprising. Mrs. Weston was a physics eh. Mrs. Weston was a physics professor, which was why Jack couldn't be blamed for his obsession with duality. And if she wasn't in the classroom teaching, she was on her computer. Publish or perish, she said, whenever Edward commented on how hard she worked. Mrs. Weston wasn't all that aware of what was going on in the world beyond her work. Jack's house had always been a mess when he was little. Now it was clean, but only because he cleaned it. He'd also taught himself to cook because he got tired of microwave dinners. Now Jack was teaching himself how to take care of a cat. Aww. Uh, <laughs> three weeks after they had found Faraday, he had not only settled into the Western household, he was the boss of it, or at least the boss of Jack. Now the proud user of a state-of-the-art kitty litter station, a cat tower, and several cat beds, Faraday looked and acted like a very different critter than the one Edward and Jack had found. Edward's posters had resulted in no calls about Faraday, and he was relieved about that. If the posters had led to someone taking Faraday away, he wasn't sure Jack would have forgiven him. And truthfully, Edward wouldn't have forgiven himself. He was in love with Faraday every bit as much as Jack was. This was why he now spent even more time at Jack's house. How come you and Jack never hang out here anymore? His mother had asked the day before. Edward had been trying to read the latest horror story by his favourite author. He answered her simply, Faraday. What's a Faraday? <laughs> his mother reached out and snatched the book from his grasp. What's a boomer? Uh, <laughs> Edward gritted his teeth, but he didn't say anything. His mum set down a bowl of chicken soup in front of him. He reached for the crackers, almost knocked his milk over, milked, knocked his milk over and caught it just in time. His mum gave him a look that he ignored. Don't you remember telling me about... Sorry. Don't you remember me telling you about the kitten we found? The one I made the posters for? He asked her. Oh, sure, the kitten is called Faraday? Edward nodded and slurped his soup. Why? His mum ex asked. Edward explained about Michael Faraday and told her he was pretty sure the kitten was smart enough to develop some laws of electrochemistry on his own. If he had opposable thumbs. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. The kitten had an extraordinary ability to get whatever he wanted. A case in point was happening right now. Jack's dad had come home from his latest stretch on the road the night before. According to Jack, his dad had gone straight to bed and hadn't noticed the new addition to the household. Minutes before, however, he'd shuffled into the family room and, and flopped into his leather recliner. Reaching for the remote, his hand instead encountered a handful of kitten. <laughs> I love a handful of kitten. What the hell? Jack and Edward who had been sitting on the room's big brown rug using a laser pointer to amuse Faraday, froze. Jack flicked off the laser pointer. Faraday looked around, trying to find his missing prey. When he couldn't locate it, Faraday said, Merp. Jack was right about the variety of kitten sounds. Faraday had an extensive language, which of uh, much of which Jack and Edward understood. 
Merp meant the exact same thing Mr. Weston had just said. What the hell? Or maybe... Fa I'm messing up a lot. Or maybe Faraday's version was more colourful. Edward wasn't sure. Where'd the cat come from? Mr. We Westerner asked as he popped open a can of soda. He set the soda next to a coaster Jack had ineffectually placed on the end table next to the recliner. We found him, Jack said, his usual smile wavering slightly. Mum said we could keep him. Edward was fascinated by how Jack's normal complex speech patterns became simple sentences when he spoke to his dad. Poor Jack. He tried to relate to his dad. It just didn't do much good. She did, huh? Mr. Weston scowled. Not only did Jack's dad not share Jack's personality or interests, he looked nothing like Jack. Mr. Weston was broad-shouldered and tall. His hair was black like Jack's, but his features were totally different. He had big features, large eyes, a broad nose, a jutting chin, just like the cat on the front cover of this book. What good is a cat? <laughs> Mr. Weston asked. Faraday looked at Jack's dad and said, Morp. Then he stepped on the remote right on the power button. The TV came on. It was a cooking channel. Before Mr. Weston could reach for the remote to change the channel, Faraday flicked his tail and stepped on the remote again. The channel changed and a college basketball game appeared on the screen. Jack's dad looked from Faraday to the TV and back again. Not bad, cat. Faraday said, meep, and jumped off the end table. He knew when his work was done. And that was apparently that. Mr. Weston settled in to enjoy the game and Jack, Edward and Faraday retreated to Jack's room. The addition of Faraday to Jack's life required that Jack make a few adjustments to his room. First, of course, were the already, already mentioned Kitty Late Air. Oh my god. First, of course, were the already mentioned Kitty Litter Station, Cat Tower, and Beds. There you go, that sentence wasn't so hard. Three beds, to be exact. But technically, only one of them was a bed. The fluffy kind that was like a poof with a hole in the middle for Faraday to sink into. The other two weren't exactly beds. One was a sleeping cave, kind of like a soft igloo, and the other was a hammock. In addition to these basic kitty, oh my god, accoutrements, accoutrements, <laughs> Jack and Edward had spent the better part of the previous three weeks turning Jack's bedroom into a kitten play paradise putting their combined physics knowledge and Edward's fledging interest in woodworking together, they built a series of platforms, ramps and kitty ways all over the walls of the room. The network of feline paths ran up over Jack's bookshelves sh <laughs> and then circled the room at a level just a foot or so below the ceiling. I would love that if I got a cat. I actually really do want a cat. In addition to these thoroughfares, uh, Edward and Jack built a series of chain reaction mechanisms designed to keep a feline occupied for hours. Faraday loved all of this, but what he loved the most was Edward and Jack. Aww, that's such a cute sentence. Faraday was not just a smart kitty, he was a social kitty. He liked playing group names like Catch Me If You Can, Keep Away, which usually involved him taking off with something the humans didn't want him to have, and Hide and Seek. <clears throat> Hide and Zeke. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know, it's just a playground game. Uh, it could be a reference to the other... Whatever, Faraday was far too good at all three games. He quite often tried the patience of his keepers to the point that they wanted nothing to do with him. But that's when he'd pull out his superpower. Faraday was, above all else, a cuddle master. Not aloof like any cat Edward had ever heard about, Faraday loved to snuggle and be stroked. His purr power was off the charts. Settled for the moment on Edward's lap, he had his purr cranked up to 11. Jack, sh Jack sank into his desk, desk chair and straightened his school books. He grinned at Edward. Wasn't that the most exceptional display of empathetic relation between human and feline you have ever witnessed? God, you're a nerd. Edward stroked Faraday's back. 
Faraday raised his tail into the vaguely question mark shaped happy position and said, Prrr. It was pretty amazing, Edward said. Speaking of amazing, the difference in the way Faraday felt between the day they found him and now was pretty remarkable. In just 21 days, Faraday had gone from bony and rough to soft and silky. Now perfectly filled out, Faraday was the picture of health, and his fur shined. Jack claimed this was because he used a little of his product, some kind of glop. <laughs> oh no, that supposedly made your hair glossy on Faraday. This isn't Fazgu, is it? <laughs> Uh, Edward wasn't sure you were supposed to use human hair products on cats. Okay, it was a human hair product, uh, but he didn't say anything. Faraday didn't seem to be suffering in any way. I'm just very sus when, uh, when the word gloop or glop comes up in a Fazbear Fright story. <laughs> he rubbed under Faraday's chin. Faraday shoved his head against Edward's fingers and said, <laughs> Somebody take all my audio of me being a cat and make it into like a beatbox. <laughs> make it into a make it into a track. I think we should implement a training program for him, Jack said. Edward blinked. Can you train a cat? Of course. I found a book online. It's written by a woman who makes her living from a cat act that tours the country. I'm not sure I approve of using cats in such a blatantly self-interested and entrepreneurial way. But her skills are impressive nonetheless. It's not total self-interest, Edward said. I assume she uses the money to take care of her cats too. A fair point. I'm up for training, Edward said. What do we need to do? According to the book, we'll start with simple suggestions and then move to more complex ones. Suggestions? I object to use the... To, I object to use the word command. Um, okay. Given his genius level... Jack said, gesturing at Faraday. I'm sure he'll know a host of suggestions in no time, I'm sure. Jack's prediction proved to be true. With six weeks remaining in the school year after just three months of training, Faraday was turning into a kitty performer extraordinaire. When Jack or Edward said to Faraday, Could you sit please? Faraday would sit up straight in a look at me aren't I handsome posture. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like a robot. If you said, could you please come here? Paraday would trot over as happy as you please. Please stay where you are, if you could, would freeze Faraday into place. These are weird commands, like they're full sentences. Similar polite requests could get Faraday to lie down, go and get something, wave his paw, slap a high five, roll over, spin in a circle, jump, leap through your arms and bow. It was pretty awesome, Edward thought. Now they were moving on to something akin to dog agility training. Out of space in Jack's room to build anything else, Jack and Edward asked for his mother for permission to build an agility course for Faraday in the backyard. Because neither Mrs. nor Mr. Weston cared about the wild wooden area behind their house, she agreed. They often played with Faraday in the backyard on sunny days, because he had never shown any interest in being anywhere. Edward and Jack weren't, they were sure he was safe back there. We'll never leave him outside to weather the elements or the wilds of the forest on his own, Jack had said the first time they went outside to chase Faraday around. Edward agreed. He'd, been e he'd even been nervous about coming outside to play at all. The first time they'd done it had been in response to Mrs. Weston's complaint about the racket Faraday was making running all over the house. Faraday was no longer kitten-sized, and though he was still a cuddle master, his longer limbs and extended body often got him into trouble. He was as prone to knocking things on the floor as, Ed as, Ed was as Edward was. I'm really bad with my W's today. The only difference between Edward and Faraday was that no one was constantly telling Faraday to be careful. On a warm day in early May... Edward carried several lengths of 2x12s into Jack's backyard. Surprisingly, Mr. Weston had helped Jack and Edward buy the lumber for their project. Edward theorised that Mr. Weston was thrilled his son had taken an interest in something manly like woodworking. Of course, no one told Mr. Weston that Edward would be doing all the building. 
and Mr. Weston didn't hang around long enough to find out. There was a baseball game on TV. Edward could faintly hear the game through an open window at the back of Jack's house, but it was mostly drowned out by the neighbour's lawnmower. The smell of freshly mowed grass wafted over from next door and mixed with the musty smell of the wet earth in the Weston's unattend- untended yard. Why do I know what that smells like? <laughs> I am of the opinion that we should first demarcate, demarcate our layout with chalk, Jack said when Edward showed him his plans for Faraday's agility course. Edward shrugged. That's fine. As Edward carried lumber and old tyres and tubing this way and that, he realised that Jack's chalk markings would be the extent of Jack's contribution to their project. That, and pointing here and there as he instructed Edward where to place uh, various aspects of the course. While Edward and Jack planned Faraday's agility course, Faraday prowled the yard on the lookout for large leaves left over, unraked from the fall. They were next, the next best thing to a laser pointer. Occasionally, a hefty breeze would toss some leaves around, keeping Faraday well amused while Jack planned and Edward got to work. In the weeks to come, Edward would wonder whether he'd missed some sign that afternoon, something to warn him of impending disaster. Was there a hint somewhere in the time they spent training Faraday? A whisper from the gods? Any inkling of a threat? He often wasn't paying enough attention to the things he needed to, and the idea that he'd missed an important warning often kept him awake, wondering. Still, he could never pinpoint anything that would have alerted him to what was coming, and he supposed that was a good thing. In every paradise, a serpent lurked. In Edward and Jack and Faraday's paradise, the serpent was a butterfly, a pretty orange fluttering monarch butterfly. Edward spent hours studying butterflies after it happened. He wanted to know if the butterfly's appearance was a fluke or whatever. He should have been aware that butterflies were out and about. It so happened that May was indeed a normal time for butterflies. Monarchs, Edward leaned during the terrible weeks after that day, lay their eggs in March and April. Their eggs hatch into larvae that grow into caterpillars, and then two weeks after that, the caterpillars find a nice sheltered place to start creating a chrysalis, from which the butterflies emerge. The first generation of monarchs only live two to six weeks. They have a grand time eating during that short period, and then they die after laying eggs for the second generation of monarchs. I don't know why I laughed at them dying. It's that generation from which the evil emerged. Edward wished he'd known more about butterflies. He liked to think there had been no way he and his best friends would have been outside if he'd known. But then, how would he even know that Faraday would think a butterfly was a colourful flying leaf? Faraday spotted the butterfly before Edward or Jack did. As soon as he did, he started scampering after it. The way he did after he, uh, he chased a leaf. At first, Edward and Jack thought Faraday's antics were amusing. It was like watching a bullet. The lithe, sleek, black cat leaping gracefully. The weightless butterfly swooping and diving. The way Faraday's paws reached for the butterfly, batting the air, was adorable. But then their cat romped around the corner into the front yard. Faraday, could you please come here? Jack called as Faraday rounded the side of the house. Faraday didn't come. Ooh, it's like the Undertale genocide. <laughs> but nobody came. Jack repeated the suggestion. No Faraday. Edward and Jack exchanged a look and both, and both took off at the same time. They tore around the corner of the house and they found Faraday at the front edge of the yard. Oh, happily cavorting with the butterfly. Lovely. <laughs> I so thought he was dead. Um, Faraday... Come here, Jack screamed, all concerns about commands gone. Faraday acted as if he hadn't heard a thing. Edward didn't bother to call Faraday, he just ran across the yard. Faraday wasn't paying attention to him, so Edward planned to scoop up the cat unawares and be done with the whole anxious moment. But Faraday zigged when Edward zigged. Oh, oh sorry. Faraday zigged when Edward zagged right onto the street. Faraday! Jack and Edward screeched in unison. Because of Edward's dash toward where Faraday had been, Jack was closer to Faraday when he went into the street. 
Jack wasn't particularly fast, but he moved at the speed of light that afternoon. His typical smile gone, his lips compressed in determination, he tore out into the street after the cat, and he leaped for Faraday, just as a dump truck roared around the corner and accelerated toward Cat and Boy. <gasps> They're both gonna die. And then merge, I reckon. Uh, stop! Edward yelled. <laughs> that was a very enthusiastic stop. Uh, he wasn't sure who he, who, he, uh, who he was yelling at. The truck's driver? Faraday? Jack? The only one who seemingly listened to him was the truck driver. As Edward raced toward the street to rescue his friends, the truck drivers hit his brakes. The tyres squealed, but the truck was going too fast to stop in time. No! Edward wailed as the truck ploughed right in two and then over both Jack and Faraday. Frozen. Edward stared at Jack's and Faraday's contorted bodies. He didn't step forward to see if they were alive. Both lay with their necks at an odd angle, their eyes open, but vacant. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay, I see where the story is going. Edward stumbled back, turned and threw up in a gutter. Then his legs gave way and he crumpled to the asphalt. He was strangely aware of the lawnmower droning on next door, but he couldn't hear anything else. The driver was out of his cab, on his phone. Someone from across the street was running forward, mouth open as if yelling. But all that was blurry and muted. The only thing Edward could see, clearly, was what, Jack, was, what was left of Jack and Faraday, and all he could do was sit in the street and stare into the unseeing eyes of his two best friends. Wow, that's a good line. That's a really good line. Um, question, real quick, where is, like, where's, where's the FNAF gonna come into this? That's my question, because at the moment we haven't seen anything FNAF related, and I am wondering where that's gonna come in. So, I guess we just continue reading and see if, if anything's gonna appear, or if it's just gonna be a story about a cat and a, and a boy. <laughs> Although Edward's mother let him stay home for a few days, she forced him to go to school for the last two weeks of the year. He went, like a zombie. He easily finished his coursework and he went home, relieved beyond words when school let out. His plan for the summer was to get in bed and stay there forever. His mother tolerated Edward's withdrawal for a couple weeks after school ended, but then she started nagging him to get out of the house and do something to take his mind off things, like that was possible. Edward's mind was no longer his own. It was stuck in an endless time loop, one that replayed the worst moments of his life over and over and over again. He kept seeing it in his mind's eye, happy Faraday frolicking into the street, panicked Jack, running faster than he'd ever run before, both getting ploughed over by the truck. Edward's ears kept playing the soundtrack of the moment over and over, the screech of the tyres, the thud of the impact, a dull, wet crunching sound when Jack hit the pavement, a deep, rasping wail that split the world open when Jack's father came outside. Edward couldn't take his mind off, was, off what was in... 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 Delibdi, in... I can't say that word. What was in... Del, indelibly indelibly <laughs> Edward couldn't take his mind off of what was indelibly etched there there we go um uh, wow that was really good imagery um Edward was no longer in the universe he had lived in for all but a few months of his life the Jack and Edward universe had collapsed in on itself Edward had been sucked out of it and spewed unceremoniously into this nasty dimension where he was utterly and completely alone well, except for his mum. His mum now sat at the end of his bed, fussing with the ubiquitous strands of hair that refused to cooperate with her hairdo. She looked around his messy room. There's a lot of weird words in this. Edward watched the tendons in his mother's neck tighten as she gazed at the piles of dishes on both his desk and the floor. Her attention shifted to the mountains of books next to his bed, desperate to escape the time loop. He'd been obviously... Sorry obsessively rereading every science fiction book he owned. He'd pull a book down, read it, then toss it on the floor. His bookshelves were nearly bare. His floor was not. I know what's gonna happen. I know what's gonna happen. 
he's now obsessed with like sci-fi stuff it's going to be like frankenstein he's going to put the two together so that they they're both one being and he's going to be like this is great and then it's going to kill him or something i don't know let's see his mum turned to look at him, her nose twitched, and he knew why. He hadn't showered or changed out of PJs since school had ended. Edward, I know you're grieving, his mum began. But he looked at her blankly. She swallowed and cleared her throat. Do you want to talk to someone? Edward shook his head. Who would he talk to? I mean, someone like a therapist, his mum tried. No, the words erupted from his mouth before he even knew he was going to say it. The idea of talking to some total stranger about his pain made him feel even sicker than he already did. Okay, his mum said quickly. Okay. She touched his knee. I just... I just don't know how to help you. The only thing that will help me is bringing them back. His mum frowned, and her eyes filled with tears. I'm so sorry. She swallowed and looked away from him. If only you two hadn't found that stupid cat. Faraday wasn't stupid, Edward shouted. He clenched his fists in the fabric of his space-patterned bedspread. His hand bunched up a bright purple whirlpool galaxy. Wow. <laughs> Faraday was the best cat ever, Edward screamed at his mother. Better than most people, his volume increased even more and he felt spittle fly from his mouth. I'm glad we found him. He was the only friend I've had besides Jack. Edward heaved. Uh, Edward's chest heaved. He struggled to breathe. Oh, Edward, his mother said. She got up and moved to his side, wrapping him in a tight bear hug that made him breathing that made breathing even harder. He didn't struggle to get free, though. He was sobbing now. His mother... Mother? His mother was... <laughs> his mother began rocking them back and forth. He let her. I'm sorry, she whispered in his ear. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean what I said. I feel terrible that you're hurting this way. I hate to see you like this. Edward felt the tension begin to recede from his body. He relaxed into his mum's arms, but he didn't say anything. He wasn't ready to forgive her for what she'd said. But ever since Jack and Faraday, since they, Edward hated even thinking about the word, died, both Edward's mum and Jack's mum had been blaming the whole thing on Faraday. Mrs. Weston now called Faraday that evil cat. He hated her for blaming Faraday. It wasn't Faraday's fault. Whose fault was it? Edward thought the fault was shared. For sure, the butterfly was at fault. But if the butterfly hadn't gone into the street, Faraday wouldn't have gone into the street. If Faraday hadn't gone into the street, Jack wouldn't have gone into the street. The driver, the police said, was going 20 miles per hour over the speed limit. The tyre's skid marks proved that. So, obviously, the driver was somewhat at fault. Edward's mum had uh, said the police were charging the driver with ve vehicular manslaughter. Edward thought the Westons were at fault too. They were the ones who said Faraday was too rambunctious to play in the house all the time. Maybe the woman who wrote the cat training book was at fault. If she hadn't written that book, he and Jack would never have thought to build an agility course for Faraday. I've got it, book. I've got it. Whoever wrote this book is a flipping genius. Butterfly effect. Butterfly effect. There was the imagery of butterflies before. It's the butterfly effect. Ah, oh. and of course, he and Jack were at fault too. If they had been paying more attention, if they'd gone after Faraday faster when he went around the corner, if they hadn't been so cocky about training Faraday and being so sure Faraday would follow their suggestions, if, if, if. But what good did it do to assign fault? It didn't change the outcome. Edward's mum let, let him go. She kissed his forehead and wrinkled her nose. I have to go to work. Will you be okay? He looked at the lines bunched up between her eyes. He thought there might be more lines than there were before. Well, before... I'll be okay, he told her. She pushed back and studied him f for a several seconds. Then she stood. Maybe you could take a shower, she winked at him. Edward gave her a half smile. I was trying to set a smelliest human record. She smiled back. Hmm, well I don't think you have far to go to achieve that. Actually, Edward said, there's a 65 year old guy in India who's lost 37 years without washing. <laughs> Why'd you know this? 
Uh, for a while, everyone thought he was the world's smelliest man, but then they found this Iranian dude. Iranian? Is that how you say it? That's a really weird way to say it. Iranian? No, it's definitely Iranian. Iranian dude who hadn't washed in 60 years. He's 80 years old and hates water, eats lots of smelly meat. His favourite is porcupine, and he puts animal um, the dung in his pipe. You're making that up. His mum's eyes were wide and her lip was curled. No, really, I read it in several places. His mum ruffled his hair and for some reason it didn't bother him this time. He groaned at her. Well, she said, you're going to fail at the record because if you haven't showered by the end of the day, pizza is a thing of the past. Edward gave his mum a look of mock horror. No pizza? She smiled at him and stood. She hesitated. You'll call me if you need me. Sure. Edward realised that for a few seconds when he was talking about the smelliest men, He'd forgotten to be sad. He felt a little bad about that. How could he let himself get distracted from his sadness? Jack and Faraday were more important than Smelly Man. See, he, he's getting obsessed. He's getting obsessed. His mum studied Edward for another few seconds, then took a deep breath and left his room. He listened to her head down at uh, the short hall. He heard her jingle the cl her keys and snap her purse shut. Then he heard the shush, the tap of her walk, the friction of her stockings, and the sound of her high heels. I'll come home for lunch, she called out. Okay, he shouted back. Oh my god, something just hit me. The cat is called Faraday, right? The cat's called Faraday. Faraday was known for electrochemistry. A little bit like Frankenstein. They're gonna bring him back to life. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's a week weak connection, but I feel like they're going to bring him back to life with electricity, and he's going to be conjoined with with, uh, with Edward. No, not Edward, uh, Jack. Uh, I'll come home for lunch, she called out. Okay, he shouted back. The front door opened and closed with a squeak and a thump. He sat in the silence and listened to the sound of his mum's car engine sputter to life before roaring once, and then settling into a quiet purr as she put it into gear. The purr reminded him of Faraday. He slumped down against the pillows and pulled his bedspread up over his head. Under the covers, he breathed slowly in and out. He liked it under here. He'd spent a lot of time under here in the last several weeks. It was kind of like a deprivation chamber, or as close to it as he could get. All he could hear was the sound of his inhale and exhale, and when he focused on that sound, he forgot to notice the sensations of the covers rubbing against his skin, the support of the mattress beneath him. He also forgot to notice the sour smell of his breath and his body odour. He went into a sort of nothing state. In this state, he could get the mental replay to freeze for a few seconds. But then it would start up again, like it was now. Edward threw up the bedspread. He inhaled and immediately regretted it. How could these old guys stand themselves? He'd only gone two weeks without washing, and he wanted to dropkick himself into the nearest bathtub. Sighing, Edward got out of his bed. He needed to take a shower. Oh, this is good. This is very good. When Edward returned to his bedroom after a long, hot, soapy shower, the contrast between his newly washed state and the smell of the stale air in his room was more than he could stand. He picked his way around all the cascading mountains of books to get to his window. Opening the shade let in so much sun that his eyes watered, so he only left the shade open long enough to lift the window. Then he pulled the shade again. He wanted fresh air. He wasn't ready for light. A warm breeze caught the vinyl shade and flicked it back and forth against the window frame, causing a whoosh click every few minutes. Edward ignored the sound and looked around his room. How many hours had Edward and Jack spent in his room? Maybe he should sit down and calculate that. Reading science fiction didn't seem to be enough to distract his mind from the nightmare he was replaying. Maybe a complicated math problem would do the trick. Oh, that always does the trick for me. <laughs> Edward crossed to his desk, opened a drawer and took out a pad of paper, a pencil and his calculator. He looked at the edges of his antique walnut desk. His mum had brought that desk for him when he and Jack had started junior high. Jack had been jealous of it because it was so big. Jack's desk was a spindly little thing made up of particle board covered with wood veneer. He said it didn't nurture his brain cells, so Edward had let Jack use his desk most afternoons. Jack had done most of his homework in the previous two years at his desk. 
Edward had done his on his bed. Edward wiped his eyes and turned away from the desk. He needed to add more dishes to the pile so he could barely see the desk at all. He set down the paper, pencil and calculator on his bed, piled more dishes on the desk and turned away from those memories. He wandered over to his shelves. Only a few books remained there, his least favourites. They lay limply in the layers of dust that had hidden behind the other books. He sighed and returned to his bed. Plopping on the bed, he picked up his pad of paper. Wow, there was a lot of peas there. Plopping on the bed, he picked up his pad of paper. <laughs> okay, how many hours was Jack in this room? Before they rescued Faraday, he and Jack had split their time pretty equally between Jack's room and his. So all he had to do was figure the total hours they'd spent together and divide it in half. He began to try to find his earliest memory of Jack. That was easy. It was right after Christmas, when he was only two. Edward's dad had gotten him a huge set of building blocks, so he and Jack had built a massive castle. Then Edward decided to be a dragon. He threw his arms out to create dragon wings, and then he flung his hand into one of the uppermost blocks. This started a slow motion disintegration of all their efforts. In a matter of seconds, the blocks went from the castle to pile of rubble. As it did, Jack threw up his little arms, smiled and shouted, Earth cake! Edward's f <laughs> That's really adorable. Uh, Edward felt something drip from his chin, and he realised he was crying. He dropped his pad of paper and wiped his face. This wasn't working. He couldn't tally up the hours he and Jack were together without remembering the times they'd shared. He wasn't ready to do that. He looked at his empty shelves again. He needed more books. But to get them, he'd have to go to the library. Forget that. He wasn't leaving the house. That left him with TV. Edward sighed, exited his room, and went down the hall to the living room at the front of the house. The living room smelled like the lemon dusting spray his mum used. I love lemon. <laughs> that wasn't bad. It was better than the smell of his bedroom. The problem with the living room was that it was too bright. The blue sky day outside the house was shoving its way into the room. Edward shrank back into the hall as he watched some kids in the street bike past. He winced at the sound of a car whooshing by. That was a sound he, nev he wished he never had to hear again. Edward thought about returning to his room, but too many memories and not enough books waited for him there. The TV was his only hope for continued sanity. Taking a deep breath, Edward crossed the rug to the beige sofa that sat under a picture window. The window's drapes were open. He crossed the drawstring and pulled the drapes closed. The heavy maroon drapes were thermal, room darkening. So, once he closed them, the room was like a cave. Not only was the light blocked out, the outside sounds were muted. That was better. Edward plopped on the sofa and grabbed the remote. After a few minutes of channel surfing, Edward settled on an episode of an old sci-fi series which thankfully held his attention until the commercial. When a commercial for some amazing cleaning product came on, he muted the TV and thought about getting up to get a bag of chips from the kitchen. He started to stand, but then the cleaning product ad disappeared and a new one took over the screen. Let me get a drink real quick. On a black and white checkerboard backdrop, Big red words flashed across the screen. This is definitely where FNAF comes in. Grieving the loss of a beloved pet? Edward froze and stared at the TV. The image of a large, cartoonish brown bear wearing a top hat filled the screen. Oh no, what if it is? What if it is actually Fazgu? <laughs> um, the bear was talking. Edward quickly unmuted the TV as the words... <gasps> Fazbear Entertainment presents Fazbear Friendly Faces, scrolled beneath the bear. Just send in a few strands of hair from your lost pet and let Fazbear Entertainment do the rest. We use your pet's DNA to craft a face that looks exactly like your beloved furry friend. The face is then integrated onto an animatronic body to create a lo loyal pet that will follow you around forever. This is mad. <laughs> The image on the screen shifted to an example of the friendly face, and Edward watched in awe as a robotic orange cat romped around after the red dot of a laser pointer. What a small price to pay to feel old to for, to feel old again? To feel joy again, rather than wallow in those sad feelings of loss and longing. The bear looked like he was talking directly to Edward, and Edward could feel the intensity of the bear's cool blue eyes. 
on the screen, more red writing flashed. For a limited time only, an amazing deal just for you. The bear started talking again, and if you order within the next 30 minutes, you'll get free shipping. Now obviously this must be like a, like, I guess like agony, like kind of uh, pulling Edward in, I guess. Like maybe a hallucination as well. I don't know. This is, this is, this is very cool though. A price streaked across the screen. It was a lot, at least for Edward, but he thought he had enough in his savings and stash. The bear leaned forward, making his communication feel even more personal, almost intimate. If you don't love your friendly face, the bear said, then my name isn't Freddy Fazbear. <laughs> the bear leaned back and smiled, flashing a wide mouthful of teeth. It pointed at its chest. And I am Freddy Fazbear, so you're guaranteed to be thrilled with your new faithful friend. The robotic cat reappeared on the screen, and Freddy's voiceover said, What better way to memorialize there we go, a precious friend than with a new pal? Someone who will remind you of the memories you made with your pet while helping to make new ones together. Why settle for an urn full of ashes or a photo on the wall when you can have a memorial you can play with? One who you can keep company any time you want. Who will, who will keep you company any time you want. More red letters erupted onto the screen. Get your friendly face today. Call now. Call now. Faded out to be replaced by a large red phone number. Oh my god. <laughs> this is not the direction I thought this was going to go. This is good though, I, I'm pleased it is going this way. Edward looked around wildly for something to write on. Of course, there was nothing. His mother kept the living room too neat. Frantically, he read the phone number twice and then he began chanting the numbers in his head. He got up and ran to the kitchen. He grabbed his notepad, his mum ne kept next to the phone. As he pulled it toward him, he knocked the phone off the counter. He didn't even try to grab it. It hit the floor with a crack as he scribbled down the number before he forgot it. Edward pulled out one of the chairs from under the kitchen table. He sat and stared at the phone number. In the living room, a woman screamed on the TV. The sci-fi show was back on. He didn't care. If this worked out, he wouldn't need an escapism anymore. He smiled at the phone number. For the first time in weeks, it didn't feel like a monster was trying to squeeze the heart out of Edward's chest. He suddenly saw a sliver of hope for the, his future. Maybe he could have a friend after all. Edward nodded to himself, he was going to order a friendly face, and then it would be kind of like Jack was still here. As long as Edward had a robotic Faraday, he could pretend his friend was around. He stood and reached for the phone. It wasn't there. Oh, right, he muttered. He looked down at the floor. And grim it, grimaced. <laughs> the phone had a crack in the receiver. His mother wasn't going to be happy with him. He turned the phone on and heard the dial tone. Well, at least it still worked. Edward smiled and punched in the number he'd written down. So let me guess, his mother's going to notice that the phone is broken, and then he's gonna, and then she's going to find out about the, the dog, the cat. <laughs> By the time Edward had talked to the nice lady at Fazbear Entertainment and was given the address to which he should send his money and the hair of his lost pet, it was mid-afternoon, he needed to get moving. Now he was pedalling his bike along the sidewalk, just a few houses down from Jack's house. He had a lump in his throat, and the closer he got to the two-story brick house where his friend had lived, the bigger the lump got. Jack's street was only a couple blocks from Edward's. Like the street Edward lived on, Jack's street was lined with a mix of older homes that ranged from, a, from quaint craftsmen cottage, cottages like the one Edward and his mum lived in to big Tudor and tall Victorian places. All the homes were guarded by ancient oak and walnut trees, some fronted by tall hedges. Others had picket or wrote iron fences if only jack's house if only jack's house had had a fence that was a weird sentence the street was pretty quiet edward heard a few little kids squealing from behind one of the houses in the distance a radio played an upbeat pop tune the music felt all wrong it should have been slow and dark something in a minor key when Edward reached the corner right before Jack's house, he stopped his bike and leaned it against the massive trunk of an old tree in the yard next to Jack's. He stood on shaky legs and swallowed hard before he looked at the street. The street was empty, but in Edward's mind, it wasn't. He began to breathe heavily. 
What was in Edward's mind got bigger and brighter, and suddenly it seemed to jump out of his head and explode into the street as if he was watching the whole scene once again in real time. There was Faraday gleefully batting at the butterfly. There was Jack, his face stretched into a contorted expression of dread. There was the truck. Edward leaned over and concentrated on breathing. He had to get this over with. Straightening, Edward darted on, onto the street. He didn't even look for cars. He realised after he was in the street, he just ran. He trotted to the place where Jack and Faraday lay. He could, he could see them there. Wait, what? So they just left his bodies in the middle of the road? <laughs> it was a weird pro projection from his mind. He knew, but they looked real, disturbingly real. Because he could see them. He knew exactly where to find some of Faraday's fur. When he got there, though, he realised he wouldn't have needed his mind's upsetting reenactment. A bloodstain marked the spot of Jack's and Faraday's last seconds on Earth. When Edward saw it, he had to clamp his mouth shut to keep from spewing what was left of his undigested soup all over the street. Wanting this over with, Edward spastically scanned the area around the bloodstain for black hair. Oh, right, so there wasn't the bodies, it was just the bloodstains and the hair and stuff. Finally, he spotted some lying at the end of the rust-coloured splotch. Pulling a plastic bag from his pocket, Edward quickly leaned over, plucked the hair from the road, and dropped it into the bag. Then he ran back to his bike, grabbed on, and pedalled away as fast as he could. He was home just a few minutes later. <gasps> Wait! Did he accidentally take Jack's hair <laughs> and then make him into a, into a cat? Tearing into his house, Edward slammed the door and leaned against it, panting. Okay, the hard part is done. Just two more things to do, and they're easy. Edward hurried into his mother's home office, perfectly neat and decorated in creams and pale blues. He went into the pine storage armoire in the corner of the room and dug inside it for a small padded envelope and some stamps. He took both of these back into the kitchen and put his money and the plastic bag of Faraday's hair inside the envelope. He added the right postage and after checking the time he went back outside to his bike and headed to the post office. The lady at Fazbear Entertainment had told Edward it would take eight weeks for his friendly face to get to him. Eight weeks? That was a long time but it was better than being forever without Faraday and Jack. Of course, he knew that his friendly face could not and would not replace Jack and Faraday, but he believed that having an animated reminder of the kitten that he and his best friend had loved so much would help him start wanting to live again. Because right now, he didn't really care too much about life. Edward marked his calendar with the, appro with the approximate date on which he expected his friendly face to arrive, August 28th. Every day he crossed out a square and told himself he was one step closer uh, to having what he was waiting for. The summer was long and lonely. Edward's mother suggested that he go on a camp, but he flatly refused. He threatened to put him in a summer school. Uh, she threatened to put him in a summer school. You like to learn, she coaxed. He shook his head. If you enrol me, I'll run away from home. Blackmail? Yeah, I'll find you if you do that. I read a lot, mum. Edward said, I've read a lot about going off the grid too. It won't, I won't be easy to locate. His mother just shook her head and went back to work. When Edward's mother began talking about moving to a different town for a fresh start, Edward realised he'd better do something to prevent such a drastic action. Will you take me to the library tomorrow to get some books? He asked her over a Sunday breakfast of overcooked French toast. His mum wasn't stellar in the kitchen, but most of what she made was edible. Sure, she said. The eagerness in her voice made him feel bad. She was thinking that he was snapping out of it. He wasn't. Day after day he crawled by. Finally, August 28th came and went. No package. Edward called Fazbear Entertainment. Where's my friendly face? He asked another m nice lady on the phone. Could you give me your name, dear? Edward Coulter. He listened to keyboard clicking through the phone line. Here you are, she sang out after a moment. There was a delay in manufacturing because of a production anomaly. Oh. Uh. <laughs> We're so sorry for your inconvenience, but you should have your friendly face in about two weeks. We'll include a discount coupon for another fans for entertainment order as an apology for the delay. Edward sighed. He didn't want another uh, fans for entertainment stuff. Uh, he wanted his robotic Faraday. Now he was going to have to go back to school after his animatronic cat arrived. 
Somehow, that made returning to school even more depressing than it already was. But what could he do except wait? So, he waited. Two weeks into his new school year, two weeks of being studiously avoided by every one of his classmates, two weeks of being babied by the high school teen uh, teachers who'd been informed of May's tragedy, and Edward was trying to get used to being a freshman without his friend by his side. Every day was an exercise in endurance, just getting through the long hours until he could go home and check his mail. Finally, on a Monday afternoon, he arrived home to find a package waiting for him on the front porch. Yes, he shouted before snatching it up and taking it inside. Edward dropped his backpack on the floor right, beside, right inside the door. His mum hated when he did that, but he'd pick it up later. He ran into the kitchen with his package, setting the big cardboard box with the Fazbear Entertainment logo on the counter. Edward hurried to the knife block by the stove and pulled out a paring knife. A gust of wind outside rattled the small paned window over the sink. He glanced out. The black clouds he noticed overhead during his bus ride home from school were churning low in the sky. They were in for a storm. He didn't care. Turning his back on the window, he returned to the kitchen table. Outside, a dog barked incessantly, almost f frenzied and frenziedly, so much so that if Edward hadn't been in a hurry to open his package, he'd have checked on it. Other than the crazy dog, it was quiet. The only sound inside the house was the low hum of the refrigerator. Edward began carefully slicing along the seal of the Fazbear Entertainment box. The seal was black and white checked, like the background in the commercial he'd seen. It had Freddy Fazbear stickers spaced every few inches as well. It felt kind of bad slicing through Freddy's toothy smile. The knife made a chuffing sound as it soared through the cardboard. Edward's breath came in excited little gasps that joined the knife's rhythm. Edward didn't bother to cut the tape at the ends of the box. He just grabbed both sides of the lid and yanked, tearing the tape with a snap. Taking a deep breath, he flipped back the lid and started digging through the styrofoam peanuts that covered his prize. The peanuts flew as he th reached through them. They snowed all over the table and the floor. Edward ignored them and also the small instruction booklet he found in the peanuts. He could see black hair on the body of a medium-sized cat. He was almost shaking in anticipation of meeting his new robotic pal. Digging out more styrofoam, he got a grip of his new friendly face. Then he pulled it from the box in a spray of more peanuts that skittered this way and that. Edward lifted the friendly face from the box and held it up before his eyes. Edward screamed and dropped the friendly face. It landed on its legs in the open box, and the styrofoam peanuts held it upright before uh, Edward's appalled gaze. He staggered a couple of steps back from the table. What had he done? Edward could hear his mother's voice in his head. Edward, you have to be more careful. How many times had she, she told him that his single-minded focus would get him in trouble? How many accidents had he had to clean up because he wasn't thinking about what he was doing? How many times had he messed up in school, making him the butt of the endless jokes? Though a day Edward had shot into the street to pluck hair from the pavement, the only thing he'd been thinking about was being done with, this distract, with, this, with his disgusting task so he could send off his order for his friendly face. He hadn't been really looking at what he was doing. He hadn't examined the hair he'd gathered to make sure it was cat hair. I called it, I called it. He just scraped up the first black hair he'd seen and he'd taken off. And this is what he'd got for it. Sitting in front of Edward, perched on top of a mound of styrofoam peanuts like a deformed king, the body of a robotic cat was attached to the stiff, powder white face of Jack. Not Faraday, Jack. Oh my god. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Instead of Faraday's sweet, furry face, the face Edward had expected to see when he'd opened the box, the human hairs Edward had sent in had resulted in the stark white mould of a dead-looking human face. Jack's face. On the hard material, Jack's brown eyes were motionless, but they appeared to be gazing intelligently at Edward, just waiting for Edward to say something so Jack could reply with his usual affected display of esoteric knowledge. Edward struggled to breathe as he stared at Jack's slightly flat nose, thick lips turned up in a smile, and his broad chin. 
These were Jack's features, attached to an animatronic cat. It was an abomination. Edward felt sick. Using the back of his hand to knock the friendly face out of the way, Edward dumped the, remi the remainder of the styrofoam peanuts from the box. He looked at the empty box and the thing that was part his, his friend and part cat robot. Then he wildly surveyed the kitchen. Spotting the wooden spoon in a pottery jar above the stove, or by the stove, sorry, which his mother used for her cooking utensils, he rushed over and grabbed it. He then picked up the box and held its opening level with the kitchen table. He used the spoon to shove the awful, what, creature, machine, into the box. He knew he was acting crazy, but he didn't want to touch the thing. It was just too creepy, too wrong. Once he got the nasty friendly face in the box, he pushed the instructions manual into the box as well. He didn't even want to look at the manual. He had no intention of activating this thing. He looked around again. He had to get rid of it. He didn't want to just throw it away. Firstly, if he did it, if he did that, his mum could find it. Second, the garbage was far too easy to get out of. Edward gasped and took two steps away from the table. Why had he just thought that? He shook his head. He didn't want to ponder this morbid place from which that thought had arisen. He'd read way too many horror stories and science fiction novels, watched too many macar... Ma is it macabre or ma machabra? I don't know. Macabre movies. He was being ridiculous, of course, but he still wasn't going to throw this thing in the trash. No, he was going to bury it. Huh, interesting. Outside, thunder rumbled. He glanced out the window. The sky was still roiling. He'd have to hurry. Grabbing the box, taking care not to touch what was inside, Edward hurried out the back door of the kitchen. He scurried to the garden shed at the rear end of the yard. With fumbling fingers, he turned the dial of the combination lock. It, looked, it took three tries before he got the numbers to line up right so he could get the lock open. Finally, he was able to get into the shed. He grabbed a shovel and trotted to the perimeter of the yard, right up against the fence at the edge of the property. If he could have taken the friendly face someplace off his property, he would have. He wanted it far away, but he needed the thing buried now. He had no way to transport it, and even if he did, the storm clouds were about to release their burden. He didn't really want to be outside in a thunderstorm, so he started digging. He dug a two foot diameter hole about a foot down when he saw a streak of lightning out the corner of his eye. Even though his hands smarted, he dug even faster. In only a few more minutes, he had the hole deep enough. Running back to the deck, Edward grabbed the box, then returned even faster to the hole he'd dug. The skies overhead grumbled loudly. A drop of rain landed on his nose. Edward dumped the contents of the box into the hole. The manual hit the, dust, uh, hit the dirt first. The friendly face landed on the manual, face up. Edward groaned when the rigid version of his friend's smiling features looked up at him. He tossed aside the box and began shoveling dirt into the hole at the breakneck pace. Every clod of dirt that hit uh, the jack face made him flinch. He felt like he was burying his friend alive. He could have sworn the jack face, though wearing Jack's non-stop smile, looked accusatory. Oh, that's a nice detail. Ignoring the condem co yeah, condemnation in the fake jack face, Edward shoveled until the white was obscured and finally covered completely. Stamping down the dirt once he had it all over the hole, he wasn't happy with the slight mound that it was left, but he hoped the rain might pound the dirt enough for it to settle in and around the friendly face. A couple more drops hit Edward with sore, dirty hands. He grabbed the empty box and the shovel. He darted into the shed, put the shovel where it belonged, and tucked the box behind a few other empty boxes his mother saved just in case. He'd get rid of it later. He barely got the door closed, and the lock clicked into place when before the rain started coming down in heavy sheets. By the time he was back in the kitchen, he was soaked. When he went inside, he left mud and water all over the kitchen floor. He glanced at the clock over the phone. He had just an hour before his mum would be home. He had to hurry if he was going to dispose of the styrofoam peanuts and clean up the floor before she got here. Even though Edward was now 13, his mum still came into the room to kiss him goodnight. That usually bugged him. But tonight her fussing was welcome. 
Edward was so rattled by the awful friendly face that he was having trouble slowing his breathing. The weather wasn't helping. Outside his window, the storm had, that, had just be, that had begun just as he finished burying the jack cat robot thing was now slamming into the house like an army storming a castle. Every clap of thunder sounded like a thwack of a catapult being loosed upon a fortress. Every blanket of rain that rattled against the side of the house sounded like a spray of arrows beating down on the poor beleaguered inhabitants of the stronghold. That was how Edward saw himself and his mother, two defenceless commoners, huddled against the onslaught of the enemy, unable to defend themselves. All evening, Edward recoiled every, t recoiled every time the thunder boomed. After the third time, he pulled him into himself like a turtle hiding in its shell. His mum said, Edward, what in the world? You've never been afraid of thunder before. It's not the thunder, he said. Then what is it? Her hair was down for the evening. It hung around her face, making her look much younger and friendlier than she did when she had it up for work. She peered at him as if she could figure out what was going on with him by looking hard enough. He shook his head. It's nothing. I'm just being weird. You're not weird, his mum said. Edward laughed. I thought you lawyers had some code that didn't let you lie. His mum smiled. That's true, but I am allowed to bend the truth a bit. You're not weird. You're unique. Edward laughed again. Then the rain pummeled the windows once more. He jumped up. I think I'll go to bed early. Now at his bedside, his mum felt his forehead. You feel a little hot. You might have a fever. Maybe that's why the storm is bothering you this evening. Edward shrugged. Maybe. It wasn't exactly a lie. He, was, he just might have a fever, and it could be adding to the trepidation that sat on his chest like a gargoyle. Do you want me to take your temperature? His mum asked. Oops. I'm not a baby, Edward said. I can take it myself, but I'd rather go to sleep now. His mum pressed her lips together, then nodded. She leaned over and kissed his cheek. I love you, kiddo. Love you too, mum. His mum gave him one last look, walked to the door, turned off the light, and left the room. Edward wasn't ready to close his eyes, so he blinked and let his eyes adjust to the near dark. As soon as they did, he could make out the various items in his room. Enough light came in under the door from the hallway to illuminate the outline of his desk, still mostly buried under a pile of clothes he refused to move, and the sharp contours of his shelves. A small nightlight on the other side of the room cast a glow that, hit, that lit up his bulletin board just enough to remind him of the photos he still couldn't bring himself to look at, nor take down. Edward felt as stiff as a corpse. He groaned. Now, why did he have to compare himself to a corpse? What was wrong with him? Why was he letting the friendly face bother him so much? It was just a stupid toy that went wrong. He shuddered and pulled the covers up to his chin. Or was it? The problem was, it wasn't just a toy. It was something designed to be animated, something that contained his dead friend's DNA. He didn't want to think about the thousand and one ways that he, that could be bad. Stop it. Edward hissed at himself. He needed an imagined ton Tommy, or whatever they might call it if one's imagination could be cut away from a person's mind. He, his was way too sinister tonight. Edward forced himself to close his eyes. He concentrated on a logic problem from math class and eventually he relaxed enough to fall asleep. Edward sat up in his bed. He was perfectly still. He listened. Something had awakened him. But what? Outside, rain still drummed on the roof. The thunder was so loud and so powerful that each reverberation made the house shake. Was that what had yanked him out of sleep? He frowned and kept listening. He didn't think so. The sound that disturbed him hadn't been an ordinary sound, and it hadn't been a loud sound. It had been a subtle sound, and uh, a sinuous and sly sort of sound. Something like a pattering, but not a friendly pattering like the rain. Edward reached over and turned on the small brass lamp that sat on his oak nightstand. As soon as he rotated the, w the switch, a bolt of lightning lit up the shade pulled over his window, and his nightstand light, out. light went out. So did his nightlight. The storm had taken over the power. Great. That was just great. Edward felt around in the dark and pulled open his nightstand drawer. He grabbed his flashlight and turned it on. I'm getting uh, uh, out of stock <laughs> vibes from this. 
Hesitating to see if he could talk himself out of believing he'd heard something, Edward failed to do so and forced himself to get out of bed. He listened intently, concentrating on peeling back the auditory layers of the storm so he could hear whatever that was skulking under those more assertive sounds. Was... what? Uh, sorry, what had he heard? Edward shone his light this way and that as he crossed his room. Nothing was out of place. When he reached the door, uh, he cautiously opened it. He peered out and pointed the beam of his flashlight down the hallway. The hall was empty. Edward tiptoed down the hall and aimed his light into the living room. It looked perfectly normal. From behind his mum's closed door, he heard snoring. She was a heavy sleeper. Edward continued his tour out of the house, checking in his mum's home office, in the bathroom and in the kitchen. Nothing was out of place. He returned to his room, got in bed and turned out his flashlight. As soon as he lay in head, his head back on the pillow, he heard a creak. Edward stiffened. Had he imagined that? If he hadn't imagined it, did it mean something was in the house? Something? Why did he think something? Wouldn't it be more reasonable to think someone? Reasonable, sure. Accurate? He didn't think so. He waited, again trying to listen past the storm. A faint scrape came from, a, up from outside his door. Edward flipped on his flashlight again. He shined it at his door, spotlighting the doorknob. All the slowly turning doorknob scenes in every creepy movie he'd ever watched started running through his mind, and by the time he'd gone through just a few of them, he could have sworn his doorknob was turning as well. But was it? Wanting nothing more than to hide under his bed, close his eyes and cover his ears, Edward took a deep breath and threw back the covers, keeping his gaze on his doorknob, which didn't need to be moving at all. Did it? He crept across his room, leaned against his door and listened. Rain continued to batter the house, between blasts of wind, thunder detonated, always just a second or so after the room blazed bright for an instant, the lightning was hitting close by. Between the rain's thrum and the thunder's bellows, Edward had trouble picking out any other sounds. But wait, there... what was that? He frowned, pushed harder against his door, and concentrated. Had he imagined that sound? No. There it was again. It was a chittering sound. Something like metal tapping on wood, only really fast. Or like marbles cascading down a metal tube. What was that? You see, at this point, I'm taking what he's saying with a grain of salt. Because I read Pizza Kit and didn't realise that half of it was a nightmare. <laughs> and then I regretted it. Um, I, don't, I don't think this is a nightmare. But, um, it might be. I don't know. Ugh. Edward gripped his flashlight hard and opened his door. His flashlight was pretty bright. 2,400 lumens. So he was able to brighten the entire hall when he aimed the light straight ahead. The hall was, as it had been before, empty. He swung the light toward the opening to the living room. Shadows from the, on the opening hunched in wait for him. He listened for another few seconds, and when he heard the sound again, was it more skittering than chittering? He tentatively moved toward the living room. As he went, his light and his head swiveled this way and that. Why couldn't he tell where the sound was coming from? It had to be the storm. The cacophony outside was disrupting his ear's ability to pinpoint direction. For one second, he thought the sound was coming from behind the, his mother's door. But no, that was just her bed creaking when she turned over in her sleep. She, he was pretty sure. The next second, he thought the sound originated in the living room. But when he stepped into that room and shone his light right, left and centre, he saw nothing out of place. Then he heard the sound again, and it seemed to be coming from just inside the back door. He slunk into the kitchen, then quickly aimed his light at the door. It was closed tight, the deadbolt in the right position. He heard a click and shot his light to the left. Nothing. It must have been the refrigerator. Shaking his head at his paranoia, Edward muttered, Just go back to bed and make an opossum. Would you? What's an opossum? <laughs> I have no idea what an opossum is. Oh, make like an opossum. Okay. I, I, I thought it was like a cake or something. <laughs> go back to bed and make like an opossum, would you? As he retreated back to his room, retracing his steps through the living room, his light still spastically searching for the source of the odd sounds, he idly wondered whether opossums had overactive 
uh, imaginations like his. This nonsensical query gave him a few seconds of relief from the tension, turning his muscles into coils ready to snap at <laughs> just the slightest. A pfft, pfft, pfft came from right behind him. Edward whirled. His light jittered into every inky, inky, inky crevice of the living room. It found nothing unusual. By now, Edward's breath was coming in little puffs. He was just one more sound away from screaming his head off. He couldn't take this much longer. Edward scuttled down the hall, dashed into his room, and yanked the door shut behind him. He pointed the flashlight all over his room. It was just as he'd left it. You're an idiot, Edward told himself. He strode to his bed, dove in, and pulled up the covers. His flashlight had a broad base so he could set it upright. He did that, then lay back and stared at the distorted circle of light splayed out over his ceiling. The flashlight's beam hit his small ceiling fan and contorted it into a many tentacled ceph... Oh god, cephalopod. Is that how you say it? I think so. That kind of freaked him out, but he wasn't able to turn out the flashlight. Nope, no way. Edward focused on the outer edges of the light above him. Another gust of wind hit the house with a thwump, and more rain sprayed his window. Then the rain and wind hushed for an instant. In that instance... Uh, Edward heard tapping, clear, distinct tapping. It sounded like a small animal prancing down the hall. This time, Edward didn't hesitate. He leaped from his bed, grabbed his flashlight, strode to the door, and threw it open. He aimed his flashlight at the door, sure he was going to light up whatever was approaching his room. Nothing was in the hallway. Outside, the storm's decibel level went back up. The opening to the living room brightened as lightning speared the night again. Thunder roared before the living room even had time to, be to return to its gloom. The wind picked up and it shrieked around the house. It sounded like angry banshees were descending on the house in abject fury. But even through all that clamour, Edward heard another sound. This time, it was a ticking sound. But not a regular ticking sound like a clock. Tick, 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 tick. tick. The last five ticks came very fast, and then, nothing but the storm. Edward felt like he was going to cry. He couldn't remember ever being this scared. Well, except for those few seconds before Jack and Faraday... Edward moaned and turned to run back into his room. He slammed his door behind him, not caring what, whether it woke up his mum, even secretly hoping it did wake her. He wouldn't have admitted it to anyone, but he wanted his mummy. Badly. Edward jumped back into his bed, literally, and curled up into a ball under the covers. He held his flashlight to his chest, cradling it like a teddy bear. If only he had a teddy bear. Edward rolled onto his back and concentrated on calming his ratchet ratcheting breath. You're making it all up, he told himself. It's all in your head. That's what I said. Uh, <laughs> he needed a distraction from his out-of-control, evil fantasy world. He decided to use what had worked for him in the past. He would recite pi. Oh, I know pi. 3.14159265. Uh, out loud, Edward began. 3.14159265358. His heart... The next digit is 5, by the way. You can go check. Uh, his heart rate began to slow. His muscles start, started to relax. He stopped reciting, put his thumb on the flashlight switch, and resolved. Turned it off. He clapped the flashlight in his hand, but he let his hand fall down by his side. He returned to his nice tranquilizing numbers. 9793233846264338329597169393751019750 Why is that in here? Okay. I don't think you need to recite all of those, but whatever. Uh, his eyes dro drooped close. Uh, his eyes drooped closed. He felt sleep slip in and wrap its comforting arms around him. He let it take him away from him. A clunk followed by a shush ripped Edward from his sleep. He pulled his arm from under the covers and turned on his flashlight. Its glow landed on the end of the bed. And Jack's mud-streaked smiling face, Edward screamed and screamed. Continuing to scream, 
Edward flat thrashed backward in his bed, his legs kicking out, his covers got caught in his gyrating feet, and the sheet and blanket pulled off the bed and landed in a pile on the floor. Edward's bedroom door burst open and his mother ran into the room, her own flashlight bobbing out in front of her. Edward? She was out of breath. What in the world? In a half second, Edward took his mum took in his mum's tangled hair, her pale makeupless face, her wrinkled nightshirt. Then he looked beyond her, trying to spot the familiar visage that he knew was attached to a rob- robotic cat. It was no longer at the foot of his bed. Where did it go? It had to be in here someplace. Of course, it's all in his head because he's guilty of all of it. Oh God, another one of these stories. <laughs> He hadn't imagined that face. It had been that horrible manufactured Jack face, and it had been staring right at him. But how? With shaking hands, Edward shined his light around the room. Edward? His mum repeated. He worked his tongue around his mouth because his mouth was too dry to speak. A little bit like mine right now. Sorry, mum, he said finally. She rubbed her eyes. What happened? Edward kept shining his light around the room. He kept looking for even a hint of movement, but he saw nothing that wasn't supposed to be there. He looked at his mum. I was sure something was in here. She straightened and then bent over again and picked up his covers. Setting down her flashlight, she arranged the covers on the bed. Edward realised he was still crouched by his headboard. He made himself stretch out his legs and he slid them under the sheet and blanket. His mum sat on the bed next to him. It's the storm. It messed with my sleep a little too. Edward nodded. Come on, let's get you tucked back in, his mum said. He let her baby him. He could feel himself trembling, and he hoped she didn't notice. The storm moved on to torment a different town just before dawn. Edward was awake to listen to it withdraw. He was awake all night. For reasons he didn't understand, he had never heard another odd sound after his mum returned to bed and he hadn't seen Jack's face any more that night. Where had it gone? He spent the better part of the night trying to figure out whether he'd imagined the dirty, stiff, white face of his friend at the end of his bed. No, that wasn't true. What he'd been doing was trying to convince himself that he hadn't seen it, that it had been some weird trick of the light, a misperception, his brain turning a lump in the covers into the Jack features. But he knew he was deluding himself. He'd seen what he'd seen. Maybe he's just hella high. (laughs) Jack's face had been looking right at him. It wasn't something that looked like anything else, but Edward sure wished it was, because after that night, he began seeing the horrid Jack face everywhere. The first time Edward saw the Jack face again, he was getting off the bus at the end of the day after the storm. Apparently, his classmates had stopped feeling sorry for him, and now they were mad at him for for suggesting Schrodinger's cat as a paper topic. I love that topic of Schrodinger's cat. Uh, (laughs) pausing to flick off a spitball that hit him just as he went down the bus's steps, his gaze landed on the yellow mums that surrounded Mrs. Phillips' baseball cap wearing gnomes. Her gnomes wore the caps starting in September until the World Series was over. Can I just say, this is a very creepy idea of like the face appearing everywhere he goes. Um, oh, it's very reminiscent of the, uh, the Fredbear plush. Huh? (laughs) <laughs> um, also, uh, Schrodinger's cat. It's funny you should mention that because that is a cat that's in a box and you don't know if it's dead or alive, if it's got a 50-50 chance of it dying. I guess that could have like um, connections to this story. Like, like it's you don't know if it's dead or alive right now because it's all in his head, right? I don't know. I need some time to think about that. Edward was shrugging into his backpack when he saw the face. It was right where he and Jack had found Faraday, and it was peering up at Edward from under a low-hanging rhododendron branch. Edward gasped and stared. Then he blurted, What do you want? What do I want? Mrs. Phillips asked. Edward jumped up and looked up at Mrs. Phillips' walkway. A magical weed disappearer... (laughs) Mrs. Phillips said. Do you have one of those? The widow was kneeling at the edge of her walkway, pulling weeds. Long grey hair spilled over her hunched shoulders. She wore a bright fuchsia running suit and a purple tennis shoes. (laughs) A purple tennis shoes. Oh, hi, Mrs. Phillips. I didn't see you there. She frowned at him. 
brushing dirty fingers across her tan, lined face. Then who were you talking to? Huh? Edward flicked his gaze back down to the flower bed. Jack's face was gone. Apologies. Uh, he looked again at Mrs. Phillips. Oh, I was just practicing lines for a school play. Mrs. Phillips smiled. Good for you. I wish you luck with that. She returned to her weeding, and Edward waved goodbye and turned to continue down the street. As he walked, he scanned his surroundings. Where had the friendly face gone? Or more important, had he really seen it again? Before he'd left for school that morning, Edward had considered going out into the yard to see if the thing was still buried there, but there was no way to do it without his mum knowing about it. She left for work right when he left to catch the bus. Now he wasn't sure if he wanted to know if the jack-faced cat was still in the hole. If it was, that meant... what? That he was losing his mind? Or that the nasty thing had the ability to dig itself out and rebury itself just to torment him? It's all infinite possibility, Jack's voice whispered into his mind. Unfortunately, Ed wasn't a plan of... Uh, wasn't a fan of duality right now. It suggested far too many alarming options. Edward hurried up the sidewalk. In dizzying contrast yesterday and the previous day, today was mild and sunny. Several people in the neighbourhood were, were out cleaning up debris from the storm. A lot of branches had come down. Leaves and twigs were everywhere. Edward heard at least three leaf blowers and one lawnmower. The air smelled like mul mulk, mulch, <laughs> Just before Edward got to his own walkway, he caught a glimpse of something white out of the corner of his eye. Turning, he was sure he saw the jack-faced cat trot around behind his neighbour's house. Edward starred. St starred? Stared. <laughs> Should he go after it? He felt his legs start to shake. Well, there was his answer. He was too much of a coward to go after the thing and, what, confront it? Destroy it? He had no idea what to do. So, he'd do nothing. Edward ran up his walkway and scrambled, uh, scrambled at the lock on his front door and dashed inside. He slammed the door behind him. Leaning against it, he took several deep breaths. Should he go into the backyard and dig? He had to. Heading to the door before he could change his mind, Edward went out into the backyard and looked at the spot where he'd buried the jack-faced cat. The mound was flattened down, but the rain could have done that. Given that a small puddle had collected on top of where the mound had been, that was likely. Other than the puddle, the area looked just the way Edward had left it. Edward? Edward spun around. His mum stood on the back deck. What are you doing? She called. Oh, just checking for, um, s s storm damage. Good thinking. That's why I came home early. Want to help me do a little yard cleanup? So much for digging up the hole. Edward couldn't help but notice he felt relieved. By the time Edward went to bed that evening, he was too tired to even care what the friendly face was doing. And the next day, the kids at school were so der derisive, he began to think it might be nice to have the friendly face around after all. Maybe the freakish robot was the only friend he would, have to, he would hope to have. But no, he didn't want that thing as a friend. He didn't want it at all. Which was why, by the end of the week, Edward was a fidgety mess of overreactive nerves. It didn't seem to matter what he wanted. He kept seeing the jack-faced cat everywhere, or at least he thought he did. When Edward and Jack had been in junior high school, they'd ferreted out all of the good secluded spots in the building, places they could hang out without encountering other kids. They'd often talked about how their first task as a freshman would be to find those sorts of places in the high school. Well, Jack wasn't here to help, but Edward still went looking for, a seclu for seclusion, and he found it in an old, unused supply closet under a back stairway, in a hidden courtyard, behind the teacher's lounge, behind a section of collapsible bleachers in the gym. But every place he found, the jack-faced cat found too. He only got to use each of his reclusive spots once before he spotted the face peering at him from the deeper shadows of the hidden areas. That's so creepy. Twice he was sure he saw the friendly face hunched over it, the... Uh, hunched under the bushes near the school's entrance, tucked among the leaves, just out of view of the casual passerby. At home, he spotted Jack's face in the bushes and plants in his yard, poking up through the hydrangeas, <laughs> I don't know flower names, outside the kitchen window. 
Peering past the boxwood hedge outside the living room window and lurking in the branches of the drooping Forsythia <laughs> bush under his own window. And the sounds he'd heard the night of the storm. Now he heard them everywhere, chittering, ticking, bizarre pneumatic pattering sounds. He heard those all the time now in his hiding places at school, in his house. He'd heard the strange sibilant pitter-patter outside his door every night this week. Whoa, what if he, what if he's, um, what if he's like living in a dream? And he can, and he can hear the outside thing, but he's like paralyzed in a dream or something. That, that's a weird theory. Uh, that's a terrible theory, actually. Uh, gra <laughs> granted, he never opened his door to see just what was out there. But he had slept with his lights on. He'd wait until after his mum went to sleep and he'd turn on the brass lamp. The first night, he didn't sleep well with all that light. The next night, though, he went right to sleep, probably because he was so exhausted from two nights of practically no sleep. Now it was Friday, four days since the storm, and Edward still hadn't gone up to dig the jack-faced cat's grave. Two days after the storm, it had started raining again, and it hadn't stopped until today. The sun came out at noon, while Edward ate his peanut butter sandwich by himself next to a window in the school cafeteria. It was then that he decided he had to check the hole when he got home. If the friendly face was still there, he might have to ask his mum to take him for an M MRI. Maybe he had a tumour, or maybe he was he, maybe he was going crazy. Maybe he'd imagined the whole friendly face thing from start to finish. The very concept seemed outlandish to him, even now. Give me an ending! <laughs> After school, Edward was running late when he trotted toward the bus. He had enough time, but he wouldn't be able to pick up his seat the way he used to. There were certain kids he never wanted to sit beside. Kids who liked to torture him more than others. He was late because he'd gone into the deserted restroom after his last class. While washing his hands, he'd glanced in the mirror and spotted the jack face looking over his shoulder at him. But when he wheeled around, there was nothing there. He thought he held a pattering behind a vent cover that looked askew, and he was debating whether he should check it when three other boys had burst into the restroom. Edward had been forced to run before they tried to stick his head in the toilet. A bit like Col- uh, what was his name? Colton? I, I believe it was Colton. Colton from, uh, from what we found, who got his head stuck in the toilet. Uh, uh, now Edward was just a few feet from the bus when Eddie, one of the particularly obnoxious guys in his class, deliberately bumped into him. Edward staggered and almost fell. He was close enough to the bus to put out a hand and catch himself. When he did, he got a glimpse of the jack face peeking out from behind the bus, bus's back fender. It was clinging to the emergency exit, hidden between uh, Edward's bus and the bus behind, down low where no one except Edward could see it. It was on his bus. Edward backed away. He was bumped again, this time by Julia. Watch where you're going, she snapped at him. Sorry, he didn't even look at her pretty wavy hair as he continued to backpedal. The buses, the buses in front of Edward started to roll forward. Coming? The bus driver called from inside. Edward looked at the wheel well, uh, looked at the wheel well where he'd seen the jack face. He thought he'd saw movement, but he wasn't sure. No, I forgot something. I'll walk. Thanks. Don shrugged and closed the bus door. The bus pulled out. Edward stared at it after it, but it didn't see anything except kids through any of the windows. <sighs> after the buses were gone, Edward sighed. He just left his paranoia force him into a six mile walk. Brilliant. Sighing again, Edward settled his backpack more comfortably on his shoulders and started walking down the school driveway. How long is this story? Oh my god. Okay, we should be there soon. The road that led from the school back into town didn't have any sidewalks, just a narrow gravel verge that was snug up against the massive tree trunks lining the road. Along the verge, ferns and other low-growing underbush created a green shaggy carpet that extended into the dusky depths of the forest. Here and there, the shaggy carpet gave way to beds of fallen fir needles. These were the paths that a lot of kids used to head into the woods. Not Edward. He would stay out here on the road, thank you very much. A few cars motored past Edward. One of them honked its horn. He had no idea who was in it. Beds... Wait. 
Never mind. That was a line from before. That the formatting is weird. Uh, he coughed on the gas fumes that lingered in the wake of the last car. He turned to look behind him to see if more cars were coming. He froze. No cars were coming up the road, but something was. <gasps> it was the friendly face. Is he going to run him over? <laughs> it was right there, clear as could be. No mistaking it for anything else. This wasn't one of those fleeting glimpses. This wasn't just a peek of the pale Jack face. This is the honest to goodness, real friendly face, the black cat, its fur now matted and muddy, possibly from being buried and digging itself out, and the haunting Jack figures with the unyielding smile. The Jack faced cat was skipping along the edge of the road. Oh, I thought it was in a car. <laughs> Gam gamboling happily ever, happily after uh, Edward as if they were playing a game of follow the leader. Edward didn't stop to think, he just ran. At first, he ran down the road, but when he checked over his shoulder, he could see that Jack's face was getting closer. There was no way he could outrun an animatronic on a flat, open road. He had no choice if he wanted to get away. Um, he, re he veered to his left, in between two towering trees. Edward scraped his shoulder against the bark of the second tree, but he kept running. He leaped over a scrubby bush, and he trampled a cluster of ferns. He didn't take time to look behind him again. He just fled, pell-mell, through the damp and dingy woods. A few hundred feet into the trees, Edward reached a creek. He didn't slow down, he splashed across it. He raced up the incline on the other side of the creek, slipping when his feet encountered a pile of river rocks. Windmilling his arms to get his balance, Edward turned, intending to run along the flat part of the terrain here, instead of having to climb any higher up from the creek. But a, a splash made him check back behind him again. The cat thing was capering along in Edward's wake. Its tail was up in the air as if it was having the time of its life. Life? It had no life. It wasn't alive. It was just a thing. Edward wasn't fooled by the thing's happy expression. The smile was too set, too hard to suggest any good feelings. Given that the jack-faced cat was functioning, moving, maybe even, God forbid, thinking, it was fair to say it was alive, at least in a robotic way. That meant when he'd put it in the hole and covered it with dirt, he buried it alive. Was it angry? What would it do when it reached him? Edward squeaked in panic and turned to run again. Scrambling up a slippery bank, he fell to his knees and clawed his way to the top. Realising that, the... that his backpack was slowing him down, Edward shrugged out of it and he managed to get back on his feet. His breath came in ragged gasps, and he ordered his legs to keep going, to run, hard. It had been stupid to run into the forest. He'd have been better off on the road, where there are other people, where someone might be able to pull him over and help him. He tried to think it through while he ran, tried to discern whether he was still being followed. At first, all he could hear were his own footfalls and laboured breathing. But then he heard the ticking and that pneumatic sounding patter. His throat tightened. Frenzies, oh, frenzied, he ploughed his way through a dense thicket of some greenery he didn't rec recognise and found the creek again. It had curled around. He figured if he recrossed it, he'd end up back at the road eventually. Could he stay out in front of the jack-faced cat long enough to get there? He risked a glance over his shoulder. Go away, he screeched when he saw the thing frisking along merrily, bouncing and hopping playfully in the furrows. Edward's feet left in the undergrowth. He put his back to Jack's face and stumbled toward the creek again. When he reached it, he leaped across its deepest part. His foot landed on a rock, and his ankle twisted. He cried out, he, but he didn't go down. Tears filled his eyes as he kept running, ignoring the throbbing pain. He wasn't sure how long he ran after he crossed the creek. It felt like he was running in circles. Was that the same tree he'd just passed? How could he tell? They all looked alike. He didn't look back again. The occasional tick, tick, tick was enough to let him know his pursuer was still after him. The pain in his alcohol got worse every time his foot pounded the ground. His legs started feeling weak. He could hear rails in his lungs. His felt... His felt... His heart... I, I, I think there's a, a mistype there. I think it's supposed to say he felt his heart trying to hammer its way out of his chest. I don't know though. Uh, he was beginning to think he was going to run himself into death from exha exhaustion uh, when he noticed light creeping in between the trees ahead. 
He thought he heard the rush of an engine going past on the road. He was almost there. He tried to run faster, but he was so tired. His steps faltered. Something touched Edward's ankle. He glanced down. The jack face smiled up at him. Edward screamed, put his head down, and pumped his arms to push his body even faster. Just a few more steps. He sprinted hard, his gaze firmly on the ground in front of him so he couldn't trip over something and go down. He couldn't see clearly, though. Uh, everything was blurry, probably because his eyes were filled with tears and sweat. It didn't matter. He kept running. He bolted forward, pelting away from the thing behind him, hurtling toward what he hoped was... Edward felt a flash of pain, so intense, that it couldn't possibly have been real. The pain was the last thing he felt. That pain was incomprehensible, and it was the last thing he thought. He never even had a chance to think. Sorry. No, that's not the ending. Okay, I thought that was the ending. <laughs> I got scared there. The semi-truck that hit Edward started skidding right after the impact. The driver, his eyes bulging, his heart racing, his stomach suddenly in a bilious knot, practically stood on the truck's brake pedal. Of course, it was too late. The semi-truck kept going for several yards before Jack Niff knife knifing to a stop. Well, well behind the truck, Edward's body lay in the road, a pool of blood widening around it, a few feet away, partially hidden in the ferns at the edge of the verge. The frowny face hunkered down. It flicked its robotic tail. Its smiling jack face kept its gaze serenely focused on Edward's still form. It would wait now. It would wait patiently for Edward to get back up. So they could play some more. No, that's not the end. That's the end. Oh, that ending is bittersweet. Okay. Okay. I do have... I do have, uh, what are they called? Goosebumps. I do have the goosebumps on my face. Wow. That was a good ending. That was a really good ending. I feel like it happened very suddenly. But, um, but the, the last few lines, wow. Just wow. That last line in particular, it would wait now. It would wait patiently for Edward to get back up so they could play some more. It's like so creepy. So creepy, so... Hmm. Interesting. I, I guess, um... Obviously, um... The friendly face was probably programmed by Fazbear Entertainment anyway to, like, say that sort of thing, to, to think that sort of way. Uh, but I guess also half of it is uh, actually Jack. So I, I think half of it is cursed and half of it is just, like, I want to play with you. Why are you, why are you running away from me and stuff? I don't know. This is a really weird story, but it was so good. It was such a good story. I don't know. I feel like I missed a plot point or something. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, oh, this is a weird one. Oh, that was so weird, but so good. Okay. I really like the idea of the, um, the Fred, Fredbear plush. Appearing everywhere, you know in FNAF 4 when it's like the flower and then it's under the gutter. I really like that idea um, And I really don't know what this could mean in terms of the FNAF law I think I'm gonna to speak to some guys after this and and figure it out, but I Don't know. <laughs> like, I don't have any thoughts Anyway, do you have any thoughts make sure you comment down below did you enjoy this is a very long story apparently this book is really long as well including stitch wraith the stitch wraith is an abnormally long stitch wraith so i can't wait for that anyway thank you guys so much for watching and i will see you in the next audiobook which will be sea bonnies which is exciting <laughs> see you later goodbye